Hey, good morning, everybody. This is Michelle Ike. I am the teaching pastor here at the Vine Church Online, and it's great to have you with us this morning. I am going to do part three of the identity theft. I've been doing a series on this, and I feel like identity theft is something huge, and it's something that happens to us spiritually when our identity as children of the Most High God gets stolen. We start believing lies, and it really gets our life off track. So last week, I talked about Wolf Boy, Case of Mistaken Identity. I wrote about this idea of identity theft in my book that I had published in 2009. If you missed that sermon, you can go back and watch it. But I'm going to be kind of following up on that today. And today I'm going to be specifically talking about how trauma in our lives lies to us, makes us believe things about ourselves that aren't not true, and it gets our lives off course. So you could see in the book, Wolf Boy, in the story, Stephen had a traumatic experience happen to him. He was stolen from his parents as a baby. He was raised as wolves. And so that trauma kept reliving, he kept reliving it every single day because he was in an environment that lied to him. And some of us have come from environments that lied to us and didn't tell us who we really were. Stephen had a breakthrough when he saw himself in the mirror. He saw his dad. He realized he wasn't a wolf. He was a boy. And then the journey of healing began. And he didn't wake up the next day and start playing out on the swing set and going to school. No, he had to renew his mind to the truth of who he really was and who he was born to be as a son, as a human. Remember, identity comes from birth. He wasn't a wolf. So he had to dispel the lies with truth, renew his mind to what God said about him, what his family said about him. And then those wolf-like behaviors would fade over time as he is more and more established in his real identity. And that's how transformation happens. So the key to transformation is not to focus on our negative behaviors, but to focus on our identity and renew our mind to that truth. So this is what God's word has to say about this. Romans 12, 1 and 2, a key scripture in transformation. This is the Apostle Paul, and he wrote this. I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. Okay, that is really how it's done. Yes, God shows us who we are, but we need to renew our mind to what he says about us, and we need to get rid of that stinking thinking. Stephen had to get rid of that stinking thinking, the lies he believed in the enemy territory, and renew his mind to the truth of who he really was born to be, and the whole time he was a boy, he was a son. So the butterfly is really that symbol of transformation. It's being that new creation in Christ and the old has gone, the new has come and we continually renew our mind to what God says about us because let's face it, we all probably on a certain kind of level believe lies about ourselves and God's word is truth. God's word dispels the lies. We renew our mind to what he says and then and only then <laughs> will our behavior line up with what we believe on the inside to be true about ourselves, okay? So, um, you know, maybe Stephen is making progress and, uh, you know, he's trying to figure this thing out and they're working on getting him to eat at the table with the rest of the family, using a knife, using a fork, a plate, a, a cup and saucer and whatever. And, you know, he's, he's learning. It's a little awkward at first, but he's figuring it out. Then one day out of the clear blue, he just... He, his mom sees him eating out of the dog dish. What should she do? What should she do when he is exhibiting a behavior that doesn't line up with his true identity, but is attached to the lies he believed about himself and the habits that formed as a result of those lies? Oh my gosh, scream at him, punish him, whack him on the nose. No, she needs to redirect and say, wait a minute, Stephen, remember? you are not a dog. You're not a wolf. You're a boy and you eat at the table with your family. You're one of us. You eat at the table with your family. Remember? Oh yeah, I remember. And so sometimes we find ourselves going back into these old behaviors of our old self, our old self that believed lies about us. And then we uh, start doing something that is not in line with who God made us to be. And it's like, what should we do? We need people who are around us 
who can point us to the truth. In the case of Stephen, he had his family. He had people who were established in their own identity. Amen. They knew who they were, and then they could tell their child who he was. And that's so important on this journey. We need to surround ourselves with like-minded people who are going in the same direction. And uh, I write about it in the book on recovery, how to kill an addiction recovery with God, but I have a chapter called birds of a feather, right? You've heard the statement, birds of a feather flock together. Well, are you hanging around with chickens who are afraid of everything? Are you hanging around with vultures who are ready to attack everybody? Are you hanging around with ostriches who are putting their head in the sand? Or are you hanging around with eagles who are soaring to new heights and understand who they are as warriors? Amen. That's so good. So um, sometimes renewing our mind and breaking free and leaving old habits means getting a new group of people. <laughs> and I could preach on that. All right. So we break bad habits that are attached to our false beliefs about ourselves by renewing our mind. We focus on the behaviors, but we've got to focus on the mind that is feeding those behaviors. Amen. The lies that we believe ourselves will manifest in our actions. The truth we believe about ourselves will manifest in our actions. Proverbs 23, 7, as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. As a woman thinks in her heart, so is she. What we believe about ourselves to be true is going to manifest. If Stephen believed that he is a wolf, then yelling at him for eating out of the dog dish isn't going to do anything. Don't focus on the behavior. Remind him who he is and the behavior will go. I could preach on that. That's so good. All right. Uh, so I volunteered with two different ministries, mainly working with women, one through the Chicago Dream Center and two through Women of Alabaster, which I still am involved with that ministry as a life coach. And coincidentally, they both have a farm. And on the farm, the women find out who they really are in Christ. They have been raised to believe lies about themselves. We counter the lies with God's truth. We don't focus on the behavior and the behavior will eventually fade. Just like all Steve's wolf-like behaviors will eventually fade the more and more he realizes that he's what? A boy. When you know who you are, you know who you're not, and your behavior will reflect that. So my time at the farm impacted what I'm doing now, which is Voices of Recovery. I'm the host of a show called Voices of Recovery. I've talked about this multiple times, and it's on Facebook and YouTube. And every week I interview somebody who has overcome a life-controlling issue with God's help. And I love to hear the stories. I love to hear people's testimonies of their journey, of the mess that they came out of, what God set them free from, and how they're now helping other people by sharing their story and bringing light into the darkness, which is what happened to them. And it's so powerful. But to get ready for these interviews, I uh, read a lot of books. So a lot of the guests on my show have written books, and I love to promote them and their book. And um, I'm getting ready to do an interview uh, of a woman named Paula Jauk. I don't know how to pronounce her last name, J-A-U-C-H, but she wrote this incredible book called Cross Addicted, Breaking Free from Family Trauma and Addiction. And she really focuses on how trauma happens to us. We believe lies as a result of the trauma and it steals our identity. And that's really what I want to focus on today because she unpacks trauma like nobody else I've ever heard from. I've talked about it on the show before, but she really makes the connection to the identity theft as a result of trauma, believing lies, and then acting out that behavior. So Paula had her identity stolen as a child. She was raised in a family where her dad had addictions. He was incarcerated. He was put in a mental institution for a time. So he wasn't home a lot when he was home. He was violent. He was using uh, not a good situation at all. And then Paula's mom really couldn't deal with being a single mom of six children. So she spent a lot of time at the casino and developed a gambling addiction. So Paula is raised by two people struggling with addiction who have their own trauma. And each and every day of her life was a difficult situation for her. Uh, as a result of this, um, sometimes she had to try to feed younger siblings with no food in the house. She'd get home from school and no parent would be home, no food in the house, kids are hungry. She'd have to find her mom, try to get some money, try to get people fed. I mean, she's nine. Uh, she had a, a relative sexually assault her. 
Um, you know, all of these things happened to her. And she talks about how the trauma was just like always going on in her brain. And she had a hard time learning. So imagine just being consumed by stressful situations. And maybe you can relate to this. Maybe something similar happened to you. And, you know, like when I have been preoccupied with something, I'm really worried about it. Well, I don't worry, <laughs> right? I cast all my cares on Jesus. Well, you know, I'm concerned about different situations or maybe you're waiting for a phone call from the doctor to see, you know, if, if you have a diagnosis or you're concerned about one of your kids. I mean, like you, we've all been in that space where our mind is like completely consumed with something and we're obsessing over it. And then somebody's trying to talk to you and you're like, wait, what? Oh, I'm sorry. I wasn't listening. Why? Because you're thinking about something else. And that was the situation for Paula. She was in school and thinking about what, what happened last night at home and how her dad had a bunch of people over and, you know, there was a fight and there was blood everywhere and there's glass breaking. And then, you know, what am I going to come home to tonight? Is my dad going to be home? Is mom going to be there? Is there going to be food? All of these things occupying her mind all the time. And then she can't learn. And she's labeled somebody with a learning disability. She thinks something's wrong with her. She thinks she's stupid. And it's just because of the trauma that she is enduring. And I mean, it's, it's so clear how these things happen. And I was a teacher for over 20 years and I'm just thinking back to different kids that I had, you know, and I probably got on, I'm like, why aren't you paying attention? What, why did you get an F on the test when I know you know this? You know, instead they needed somebody to, to get down and look them in the eye and say, are you okay? What's going on? You seem really out of it today, you know, can I help you? And I wish that I would have had those conversations more because I know I had hundreds of kids like this. And why am I talking about this today? Well, in Paula's book, she said that 61% of men and 51% of women have endured a traumatic situation in their lives that has affected them probably into adulthood. And it can be abuse. It can be an accident. It can be rejection. It can be the divorce in a family. It can be one parent leaving. There are a lot of different things that can cause us trauma. And uh, living with two addicts is certainly going to, to do that. And yet she thought it was normal. That was her normal. Whatever we're raised with, we believe that everybody's life is like this. And then our eyes are opened. She went to a friend's house and had a nice meal. Mom and dad were there and they had a conversation at the dinner table. And she's like, this is so weird. No, it is the way it's supposed to be. But her dysfunction and her trauma were normal to her. And then what happened? Well, she began to have children. She had her first child at the age of 15. She got involved with a gang member. And because she didn't really have that sense of belonging at home, she found it elsewhere. And that's what a lot of people do. A lot of young people do. They want that family. They don't have it at home. So they go find it on the streets. And even though she was initiated into the gang by getting the tar beat out of her out in the desert, um, you know, she's like, it was the most important thing to belong. She didn't think about the beating because she was just able to forget it and numb it because she's had so much trauma in her life. And she said that, uh, you know, from the age of zero to 18, I think there are like 6,500, approximately 6,500 days, 6,500 days of her childhood. And almost every single day is a traumatic experience. That's going to affect her and impact her as an adult. The lies that she believed that she was worthless, that she had no value, that she wasn't important, that she wasn't smart. And this, this adversely affected her life. So she starts having children. She had three children by the time she's 21 with a gang member who abused her, cheated on her, sold drugs out of their home and, you know, brought violence and crime into their home. And, you know, she finally broke free from that. God began to draw her and her story is amazing. I can't wait to meet her and talk to her more about this, but I loved her book and her transparency. And it's like, no wonder this is happening to her. And, you know, she would just cry all the time. And her six-year-old said, I hate you. You cry all the time. Like she wasn't even able to be a mom to her children because she had so many brokenness from her childhood, so much brokenness. And you can see how these cycles perpetuate. You can see how the cycle continues unless God comes into the picture and changes things. Amen. So she started to learn who God was for her, learn who she was in his sight. 
And she made some major changes. She moved away. She had to break free from family. She had to set boundaries. She started making different choices for her children so that they could have a better life. You know, a lot of times we're raised in a certain kind of way and we say, oh, you know, I'm never going to be like that to my kids and I'm never going to do what my parents did and I'm never going to repeat what they did and, and things like that. But then we do, we do, we do the same thing. I mean, I said that with my kids, like my dad rejected me. He was not there. And then what did I do? I married somebody just like him. That was my first marriage. And you know, then, then he, he rejected my kids and, and wasn't there for them. And that's how the cycle continues and how history repeats itself until God gets in the picture, until God gets in the picture. That's the key. So we can't just say, well, you know, I'm sorry, these things happen and that's too bad and I can't help it. We can help it because we can invite God into the situation and he is going to shift things. The cycle is not going to continue in my children. With my last dying breath, I will continue to pray and declare God's love for them. And they're seeing that. They're seeing the love of the Father, just like I've seen the love of the Father, and not being so impacted by the rejection of their earthly father. So Paula, you know, would have had children and raised her children like she was raised, but God got into the picture, came into her life, and shifted things and showed her a better way. Amen. So thinking about her, you know, in her life, I mean, let's ask the question, what was wrong with her? What was wrong with Paula? Absolutely nothing. Nothing was wrong with her. She just believed a lie. Amen. That's where it is right there. Well, she, you know, was cutting herself and she was involved in gangs. She was using drugs and she had an eating disorder and she was getting involved with men at a young age. No, 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 no. Those are symptoms of the problem. She believed lies about herself. She believed she had no value. So her actions reflected what she believed on the inside. There was nothing wrong with her except she believed a lie. And what happens when God comes in and brings truth to counter the lies? Then changes happen. Then those outward behaviors start fading away when she discovers who she really is in God's sight, her creator. I could ask the same thing about Stephen from the book, from the story Wolf Boy. What was wrong with him? He's eating out of the dog dish. He's growling at the baby. He's biting the baby. He's howling at the moon. He's, no, 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 no. <laughs> There's nothing wrong with him. He's believing a lie and he's acting out that lie. He had a traumatic situation. Paula did as well. And that trauma is continuing to lie to them until God breaks in and brings truth. And then they renew their minds to that truth. And that's how that transformation happens. Renewing our mind is key. Focusing on our outward behaviors is not going to change anything. Knowing who we are on the inside will make those behaviors fade away. Amen. So, so many people live here. Like I said, half the people listening today have probably had a traumatic situation that may or may not be still affecting you. I don't know. But understanding how trauma brings identity theft is critical to understand on our journey with God because it affects so many people. And maybe you're thinking of somebody, if it's not you, maybe you're thinking of somebody who believed a bunch of lives, lies as, as a child, and now into adulthood, their behaviors are manifesting that because they haven't been shown the truth. Like Stephen was shown the mirror. Our, our mirror is the word of God and what God has to say about us. But we need to renew our mind to what he says about us. And that's our job. God put it in there. We've got to read it and internalize it so that it transform, transforms us from the inside out. So the challenging part in all this is that we don't go by God's word. We go by how we feel. Feelings. Our feelings will lie to us. Did Stephen feel like a wolf? Probably. Was he one? No. He wasn't at all. Never, never was. He was lied to. Did Paula feel worthless and unloved on many days? Yes. Is that true? No. And I can think of how I feel at times. Do I always feel loved and valued as a daughter of the most high God? No, I have bad days. I forget who I am in Christ and I need to renew my mind and have God remind me of who I am and accept that and receive it. So we go by our feelings and not the word of God, and that is not a good place to live at all. So I'm just thinking of how many people are walking around this planet believing lies. 
believing the lies of the enemy, of the world, of dysfunctional people who have raised them in an environment which makes them feel a certain kind of way, that they have no value, that nobody really loves them, that they're not important. That's what Paula experienced, and yet God broke through and brought light into that darkness, and it transformed her life and the lives of her children. And that's just the thing, you know, if, if God hadn't broken through, then her children would have been raised in a similar environment that she was, and the cycle would continue. And we see that happening all the time with generations. And it doesn't have to be that way, because God can break in and shift things so that we are not passing along our dysfunction to our children. And I want to say that in raising my kids, you know, I made, I made mistakes. I made a lot of them. But I'm, I'm partnering with God to have him restore that. And he is drawing them. He is work, working in their lives. He is showing them that he is the father that they need. And I see that. And I love that. I love them receiving that and growing up to be amazing adults and amazing humans. Amen. So um, if we don't bring Jesus into the mix, we're le left with the experts <laughs> of the world. You know, imagine if Stephen had never discovered who he was. I, I mean, as I shared last week, his mom and dad were on the way to institutionalize him because they couldn't deal with him. He was, you know, hurting their younger children. And yet, uh, you know, he did see the light. He did look in the mirror. But what if he hadn't? He might have spent the rest of his life institutionalized in a padded cell, medicated, a 30-year-old man continuing to chew on a bone and growling. I mean, that would have been so messed up, but that's where people are. How many people are in hospitals and mental institutions and medicated and going to therapy and going to counseling because they've had trauma, they believe lies, and they, they don't know who they are? You know, when something is really broken, and we can't fix it. What do we need to do? We need to take it back to the manufacturer. I mean, if your car, if you just can't figure it out, the mechanic can't figure it out, take it back to the ma manufacturer. They'll know what to do. God is our creator. And when we go to him, he can give us an extreme makeover God edition. Amen. He knows how to fix us because he made us. Amen. That's so powerful. And if he made us, he's going to show us who we really are. And when we see who we are in his sight, in his sight, it's going to make a huge difference for us on the inside. Amen. So what if by some weird coincidence, I mean, the whole story is made up anyway. So let's just say that uh, the wolves capture a little baby girl and bring her to the den. And here we have Stephen and this little girl growing up together, believing lies, having this trauma, being in enemy territory and uh, thinking they were something when they're not. And then they grow up, they hit puberty, you know, they're young adults and they figure some things out and they start having babies, baby cubs. No, they're not baby cubs, they're humans, but the, they're going to raise those babies as wolves because that's what they think they are. And so you can see how these cycles continue. I say this all the time, but it's this, you can't give away what you don't have. Stephen and his partner are not going to be able to raise normal human babies who are going to grow up and mature and be functioning adults because they don't know that themselves. So we can see how these dysfunctional cycles continue until God is invited into the picture. We understand who we are, and then we can pass those truths on to our children. It's never too late. Even if your kids are adults, it's never too late to give these things to God, to partner with him and to pray for your kids and, and pray that he will intervene in their lives. Amen. So this is what almost happened to Paula. You know, she has three babies by the time she's 21. She's in a relationship with a man who's in a gang. There's just a lot of violence, abuse, toxicity, dysfunction in the family. And this was where the direction that she was going again, until God broke through. So until God opens people's eyes to the truth, the same cycles of dysfunction will pass from one generation to the next, and we see it happen all the time, but it does not have to be that way. Amen. I don't want history to repeat itself in my children's lives, and I'm on my knees praying for that every single day. Um, so we, are, again, we have a role to play in this. I mean, God can show us who we are, but we really need to renew our mind 
daily into what he says about us. And that's back to Romans 12, one and two, where we're transforming by the renewing of our mind. We focus on the behavior, but we need to focus on the thoughts that are creating those behaviors and the lies that are uh, creating those behaviors. Just like Stephen, just like Paula, just like me, maybe just like you. So renewing our mind does take effort, getting in the word, meditating on God's word, reading the scriptures, having it become a part of us. It does take effort and it's not always easy, but you know what else isn't easy? Staying stuck in your mess and staying stuck in the lies and being deceived. Amen. Unless we allow God into our situations, things will not change for the better. And I said the word allow. God is not going to force himself on you or me or anybody. We need to make that choice. We need to invite him in. We have a free will. And when we can pray for people that he will draw them. But at the end of the day, we each have a responsibility to ask God to come in. God, I need you to help me. I need to know who you say I am. I have believed these lies for so long. My behavior is showing it. My life is in shambles. I don't want my kids to have this same reality. I want to make some real changes. I'm asking you to come in and help me. And what we typically do is we are like, okay, God, you sit tight a minute. Just hang on a minute. Give me a minute here. And I'm going to fix things. And then I'm going to bring you in. That will never happen. You know why? Because he's the fixer. He's the fixer. You know, Stephen's not going to say to his mom and dad, hey, let me go figure this out. And then like, I'll be your son. No, he's their son period. And they love him. So they're going to help him see who he really is as their son, not believe the lies that the wolves told them in enemy territory. You see how all this connects. All right. So um, Paula talked about in her book that she was obsessed with her physical body. And she had an eating disorder, she would cut herself, the cutting was like, I want to feel this physical pain to make me th forget about the emotional pain I'm facing. She was obsessed with plastic surgery. She wanted the outside shell to look better. And so she fixated on this. And a lot of times we do that, you know, it's like my inside is such a mess, but if my outside looks good, then uh, people won't notice the mess on the inside. And I know when I was coming out of a very difficult season in my life, I just kind of come to faith in Christ and I was dealing with the aftermath of some of my choices before I came to faith in Christ. I was obsessed with cleaning and organizing my house. I bought these closet organizers. I had a drill. I was putting these shelves in and I was just organizing everything. You see, I had this raging storm going on on the inside of me. So I wanted the outside to look better. And what God showed me is that he fixed the inside. And then the outside looked better. <laughs> okay. And I mean, if my husband is watching this, he'll, he'll watch this. <laughs> okay. I know I need to organize and clean more, but I, I'm healthy on the inside. So hopefully you don't mind. But yeah, I, I can use that season of cleaning and organizing a little bit of my life right now. But I would never want to go back to who I was back then because I was still believing lies about myself. I was still not feeling valued, not feeling loved. God was showing me, God was leading me. He was drawing me, but he was drawing me to his word. And when I read his word, it's like, wow, I really am loved. I really am valued. He has a plan for my life. He has a purpose for me. He's my creator. He loves me unconditionally. I don't have to perform for him. I don't have to fix myself first to come to him. And that was so transformative to my life. And I'm so glad that I, I learned that. And I'm still walking that out today. It's a process. It's not an event. Okay. So um, let me ask this question. In thinking about Stephen and Wolf Boy, when did Stephen become a son? When did he become a son? Was it when he went to school? Was it when he ate at the dinner table? Was it when he said please and thank you? Was it when he drew a picture for his parents? No. He was always a son. He was a son at birth. He was a son at conception. Okay. He was always a son. His behavior didn't change that at all. But when he understood he was a son, then what happened to his behavior? It lined up with that truth. That's so important for us to understand. 
And likewise with, with us, when did we become a son or daughter of the most high God at birth, at birth? That's who we are. Our identity is based on our birth. All right. Not our actions. I, I talked about that last week. So Stephen had to understand that he was a son, but the father understood he was a son the whole time. The mother understood he was a son the whole time. And that's one of the things we really need to get down on the inside of us. Because what we think of is our actions, our negative actions, our destructive actions, our toxic actions. And we think, how could God love me? How could God love me in this state? I'm such a mess. My life is in such chaos. See, we're believing lies. And then we distance ourselves from God. We don't let him in. We don't let him love on us because it's his love that transforms us again from the inside out. Amen. And as far as people go, you know, and I'm thinking of the people that I, that I interview for Voices of Recovery, the addict with tracks on his arm is a son. The prostitute who's selling her body for money, for drugs, is a daughter. The man working 70 hours a week because he doesn't feel like he's enough is a son. The mom with an eating disorder who's a wreck on the inside and trying to make the outside look better is a daughter. The man who's confused about his sexuality because he was molested as a boy is a son. The woman who is promiscuous because she never knew who her father was and she's looking for love in men is a daughter. Amen. God loves us right where we are but he won't leave us there unless we insist. Our actions don't determine our identity, but our identity in Christ, our true identity, will determine our actions. And when we have had trauma in our lives, trauma that has happened to us mostly in childhood, and we start believing lies, it steals our identity, and we move away from our creator, and we don't understand that we are his creation. We start trying to perform to earn the love of people, and that performance is exhausting, and I have totally lived there. And when I understood that I was loved by the Father, no matter what I did or didn't do, that freed me to understand who I was, and my behavior then lined up with that truth. It really takes God, the one who made us, to show us who we are in his sight. Religion will beat us down and make us feel unworthy, unloved, never enough missing the mark, a wretched sinner, we messed up again, but that is not who God says we are. Amen. And I read some identity verses out of Wolf Boy last week. I'm going to read a few more today. How about Ephesians 1.4? I was chosen in Christ before the foundation of the world to be holy and blameless before him. Colossians 1.14. I have been forgiven of all my sins. The debt against me has been canceled. Amen. Colossians 3.12, I am chosen of God, holy and completely loved. 1 Thessalonians 5.5, 5, I am a child of light, not of darkness. 2 Peter 1.4, I have been given his precious and magnificent promises. I am a partaker of his divine nature. Of his divine nature. Stephen was the nature of his parents. Never a wolf. No matter what he did or didn't do, he was never, ever, ever a wolf. He was always a son, but he needed to understand that for him to act like a son and access all that his family had for him. You see, when I look at people like Paula and others who I've interviewed in Voices of Recovery, these beautiful lives, these beautiful testimonies of people who endured abuse and trauma and addictions and uh, just believing lies about themselves and then that got their lives so off track but god showed them who they really were and now they're telling their stories to help other people understand who they are that's so powerful i love i love hearing these amazing stories of transformation because no one is beyond god's reach when he shows people who they really are their lives are totally going to change as a result this isn't an event but a process and it's a journey with god and we have the best person, <laughs> part of the Trinity, who's going to go along on that journey with us. And that's Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit is going to lead and guide us into all truth. Truth about what? Truth about what, Michelle? Truth about who you really are, about who God is for you, about your, how he is your father. You are his child. You are a child of God. Amen? The Holy Spirit is going to make that word come alive to you, resonate in you, make it real 
I love Holy Spirit and I love being on a journey with them. There's no one better to take it with you. Yeah, you can have your tribe of people and I recommend that. Get your eagles, get your eagles to soar with you. Get away from the chickens and the vultures and the ostriches. But Holy Spirit is amazing and he's so good at what he does. Amen. You know, certain people, places and things can kind of trigger us and take us back to that trauma. So we need to be careful. We need to set boundaries. Paula talks about that in, the, in her book. And sometimes that involves cutting people out of your life, even though they're family. But, you know, thinking about Stephen, like what if his family took him back to the wolf den six months after he'd been rescued from there? He'd probably freak out. All these memories of things that happened and it would maybe trigger him to start behaving like that again. But what if they took him back in 10 or 20 years? He'd be like, wow, that happened. And that was really weird. I kind of remember some things from there, but that's not who I am anymore. When you're secure in who you are, you can go back to those people and places. You are healed and whole and they don't trigger you and draw you back into that anymore. All right. That's so important to realize. So today I talked about how trauma can affect us. Paula's book, I recommend it. Uh, it's so powerful. And uh, I can't wait to interview her. But she made the connection for me in a, in a stronger way of how trauma can steal our identity, get us to believe lies about ourselves, get us off course. And that is going to keep us stuck until God breaks through, breaks through those lies, shatters those lies, brings light into the darkness, brings truth to dispel the lies. And that's how transformation happens from the inside out. Amen. So if this is something that you're struggling with, I, I would just ask that you reach out to me uh, because this is what I do. I have worked with hundreds of people who have overcome life controlling issues and traumas. They believe lies. And let me make something very clear. I can't fix anybody, but I can point you to the fixer and his name is Jesus. And he is the one who's going to show you who you really are. And when he does, your behavior is going to line up with that truth. Amen. So I would love it if you'd reach out to me. You can do that on the Facebook page or you can go to the vinechurchozarks.com where you uh, can find our phone number and uh, give me a call. I'd love to talk to you because this is what I really love to do. I love to point people to the one who's going to show them who they are. I love to point people to that mirror, the word of God, which shows them who they are in Christ. Amen. A son or a daughter and a dearly beloved child of God. So I'd like to end today by reading uh, one of my favorite scriptures. It's Isaiah chapter 61. And I'm going to start with verse one this morning. The spirit of the sovereign Lord is on me because the Lord anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom for the captives and release from darkness for the prisoners to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God to comfort all who mourn and provide for those who grieve in Zion to bestow on them a crown of beauty instead of ashes, the oil of joy instead of mourning, and a garment of praise instead of a spirit of despair. They will be called oaks of righteousness, a planting of the Lord for the display of his splendor. They will rebuild the ancient ruins and restore the places long devastated. They will renew the ruined cities that have been devastated for generations. Verse 7 says, instead of your shame, you will receive a double portion, and instead of disgrace, you will rejoice in your inheritance. And so you will inherit a double portion in your land, and everlasting joy will be yours. Amen. That's so good. Well, I hope that this uh, has encouraged you today. I don't know if I'm going to continue to speak on identity theft. I'll wait and hear from God on that. But when you know who you are, you know who you're not. And God calls you beloved. He calls you his son. He calls you his daughter. And no matter what you've done, he loves you. And when you understand that, it is really going to transform your life, just like it's done for me. So God bless you. Thank you so much for joining us this morning at The Vine. And we'll see you next time. Have an awesome day. Bye-bye.